Insight Session with the amazing Rory Petty, all hopped up on his fantastic Red Bull and 23 plus years of development, knowledge and everything else that makes him an amazing human being. Plus, like everyone else, he has endured COVID and come out almost smiling about it. There are good things there that he will tell you about. You too can look like this for just $9.99 and a tub of what? Almond butter, yeah? Yes, and also good news, you never have to go to the toilet for a good two weeks. <laughs> It's an efficiency. It's an efficiency, Rory. That's what that is. Uh, I can't believe that this is what these tech inside sessions have come to. I don't know what Karen's done to us bringing in you Microsoft people. It's just going to be crazy. All right. So, Karen, if you could, please, on the session, maybe you can turn off the waiting room. That way you won't have to keep letting people in. That'll be great. I am Rory going to just tell you quickly how we typically run these things that everyone else knows as well. Everybody, we have the amazing Rory Petty with us. He is going to talk to you about some crazy tech thing amongst all the other secrets of life that he will cover today. Um, if you have any questions, please raise those in the chat. If you can find that, fantastic. That qualifies you to actually ask a question. I will check on that window for anything that comes up that is related to almond butter because that is Rory's speciality. And then I will get that through to you, Rory. Outside of that, I think we're in for a fantastic session today. So without me wasting anyone's time any further than I normally do, Rory, let me give it over to you, sir. Away you go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carl. Um, and the, so the session is recorded. So you'll see my tone and demeanor completely change now uh, to uh, an advert professional. But this session is actually the similar session to I did to Microsoft Build, where I was given three weeks to come up with a end-to-end -end demo using container apps, code spaces, playwright, um, and GitHub Actions. And I, I did it. And not only did I did, do it, though, but it was simple, easy, and I had never combined all four of those technologies before. Um, and uh, it is a incredible experience to work completely in the browser. So today I'm going to show you everything, but I'm going to give myself a challenge. I'm never going to leave the browser. Now, this is actually based on my talk. It's actually called um, Take the Suckage Out of Microsoft Services. But my original talk was learning to code in the shower, where I showed how people would take all the underlying technologies and be able to push to uh, the Azure cloud and learn to code anywhere and any given time. And I'm going to prove to you that because I'm never going to leave uh, the Microsoft uh, ecosystem via a Chrome browser. And I know the irony is not lost to me. I'm using Chrome on a Mac and I'm a Java developer. So, But we do, as uh, in Microsoft, go to where the developers are. So let me start with a, a brief introduction about myself, and this is called a visual rep uh, a visual uh, a description. And I challenge you to do this in all of your, your meetings because it, it aids in the, um, the identification of accessible features for your developers. So I have brown hair, uh, I'm a Caucasian 43 year old male, and I'm wearing a white Microsoft Azure, and that's Duke. I know that Microsoft Duke, uh, sorry, not Microsoft Duke, the uh, Java uh, mascot. So today, what I'm going to show you is, uh, well, container apps, principally. Uh, and then I'm going to do a demo to show you how to get this all inside the browser. So we have some slides. Uh, we have about 50, 50 minutes, and we've got a nice demo at the end of it. And then I've got a challenge for you, a nice workshop that I've set to the product teams that you can go through and also enjoy the uh, an end to end two to three hour really engaging uh, workshop. So let's let's start with that. So please follow me on the tweeters. I do a mixture of uh, jokes, memes, and of course Microsoft paraphernalia. But uh, I, I do pride myself. I was recently voted the top brand ambassador for for Microsoft about Analytica. So I do get you know I get some really good stuff out there really quickly. This is my Logic Deck presenter. I also recommend getting one here. It's got a nice little laser pointer, and you can actually stop uh, the RSI injuries uh, around that, though. So let's go here. 
So yeah, <laughs> where do container apps actually fit in? Uh, and, and, and the minute this happened, I, I originally had a very simple slide, but then I thought to myself, I, I want to do some animation. I want to show you exactly how powerful the Azure Cloud is because there are so many features that you now have on to host your, your applications. So you can actually uh, access this on aka.ms app decision tree. You can get a link through on the right tool to use for that. But I've got a, that's me, Rory, uh, a little bit shorter than that though. And Rory's on a start here. And you can see there, there's decision trees here. You can go build, migrate, and then eventually, wow, 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 we go down all of that to get to container apps. I actually did. Rory, yes. Rory, that's fantastic, except we can't see it. <gasps> Sharing the screen. This that would be rookie, nice. This is a rookie mistake, eh? Rookie mistake. There we go. So much for that. So much for that professional lead. And let, let's try that again. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm selling a PowerPoint and everything. Okay. So coming back there, follow me on at Rory Pretty. And now back to the PowerPoint poisoning, as we call it here. So we want to start here. Azure Container Apps, you can go aka.ms forward slash app dash decision tree. And you can access all of that and work it out. Now, look at that. If that isn't complicated. So I drew a little man. And that's actually me if I was six foot three. I, I couldn't find a dwarf emblem there. So it's not it's not really gonna go there. And then I animated it. Uh so watch this out. This is this took the sum total. Uh let's just click through there. This took a sum total of five minutes to learn how to animate. And I had to slow it down also because it was so big. You start with build new. We don't need full control. We don't need HPC, no microservice architecture no event driven, we don't need full-fledged orchestration. Uh, we need a managed service. It's not .NET really specific. We're not gonna use only Spring Boot apps, not OpenShift. We don't need access to the underlying Kubernetes API. We just need a clean, if you look at that, all of that really underneath there didn't offer you a clean version of microservices or containers that allowed you to have increased developer velocity. That's really where container apps fits in. All of these are slightly opinionated, if you think about it. And you can follow the, the kind of um, the, the decision tree here and you realize, wait a second, uh, that I don't want an opinionated container. I want uh, a container service that is as powerful as Kubernetes, but without the overhead. So you can access that on app decision tree. And really, I don't mean to uh, bash Kubernetes because it has some redeeming features, but a lot of you have already kind of realized that there be dragons and you don't want to have sleepless nights. I remember I was uh, lecturing in the University of Bloemfontein before COVID and I had just you know, started my demo and I said, watch this. And I just created my Kubernetes cluster the night before, gone absolutely gone. It had just, you know, deleted itself. And I didn't understand why. And it, it appears that my ETCD had just become corrupted for some whatever reason. And, you know, it, it taught me a valuable lesson that, you know, Kubernetes can also be difficult to maintain. And you don't necessarily need to uh, manage Kubernetes if you want microservices. Um, so, we want to know why then container apps? What is the, the novelty around this? And what, how do I get started? So first of all, microservices is still here. It's not going to die because in truth, microservices is an architectural plat, uh, pattern. And the pattern dictates, hold on, I'm just going to take my sip of my sponsored drink. Mmm, Red Bull. Um, as a pattern comes, it really fulfills a, a, a certain niche though, which is I need to do a single action or single uh, decoupled and cohesive action. So you can do that with container apps. You can build microservices and quickly because all you need is a Docker file and you uh, have a microservice. Um, then event-driven processing. Now think about this, and this has been around for a while. Event-driven processing triggers an event. So why are container apps so powerful for event-driven processes? 
because the container didn't exist until the event is triggered. And now you're kind of selling what I'm smelling also because that container costs you nothing until it exists. That's one of the also novelties about Azure container apps. And while the other services didn't really provide uh, the, the same amount of flexibility because it's zero cost, zero, zero scale. So you can start with zero containers and then when an event is triggered, maybe a event hub or service bus, then you can trigger it into existence. Web applications, so it's still, and I'm gonna show you today, it, it is brilliant for web applications. So as long as you have a library, you pop it into a high performance uh, container and you have a web application. Also, when you say web application, I'm gonna drop a term in there, cloud native. Stop what you're doing right now, because if you're not doing cloud native containers, you're wasting money. So what is a cloud native container? It's a Docker file. And it's a, a library that has been compressed into a, uh, a image that basically sits as close as to assembly as possible. And you, you've heard about Knative, which sits on Kubernetes. And with Java, it's GraalVM uh, with uh, Quarkus. So Quarkus is one of the, uh, the leading platforms. So you go from 100 millisecond startup time, maybe even longer, one second startup time, to eight millisecond startup time. And that costs you less. Because remember, you're paying for cons consumption on the cloud with how long you, your, your uh, container takes to live. So if your container or your web application only exists to perform a certain service, then it costs you less. You also can do public API endpoints. So you can actually do blue-green deployment, canary deployment, you can do traffic shaping, um, and you can have multiple revisions. So your go to, uh, go to production, your go live process is much easier because you have zero downtime. And finally, I've seen a lot of people do this recently, background processing. And this also really makes sense when you think about what about AI? So if you have a, a document, you wanna scan that document, you wanna get out of all of the meta information and all of the imaging, uh, you want to bring up a container, scan the document, back, uh, background process it, go pop it into your database with all of the relevant information, and then ch uh, turn that container uh, into something else. And this is really a, a mindset that you need to understand. Your web applications are cattle now. They're not pets. You don't name them. You don't give them a name like Saturn or Asterix or anything like that. They don't exist outside their certain purpose, which is to manage the life cycle of a container. So how do you get started? So first of all, you have, and we're gonna to touch on this a little bit later, a custom virtual network. So your environment of your container apps exists inside a virtual network. You can see there, I've got container app one and container app two. Also, all of this information is gonna be av made available to you to, at the end via uh, links. And then inside your environment, you have isolation boundaries between the container apps. And I know what you're thinking, but how does container app one speak to container app two? And I'm gonna show you exactly how to do that with a new service that we have uh, launched. So inside the actual container apps, each one of those container apps really is a microservice. So you can have an app, you can have a background process, but we're gonna to refer to them as microservice. So you have revision one and revision two, and then you have the pod, uh, which contains a container. Now this looks like Kubernetes, but it is Kubernetes. The only difference between this is that you don't have to manage the Kubernetes control plane. So they took an opinionated take on it, similar to Azure Spring Apps and also OpenShift. Um, they took an, an opinionated and it's a developer workflow. So we won. We won at the end of the day. We shouted from the rooftop that we wanted a technology that was focused on developers and we won. And then you have your containers which spin up there and you can have multiple containers iPhone 10 is entering the meeting room. Yes, admit. And then from your revisions there, they're immutable snapshots. So if you're familiar with Kubernetes, you understand that a revision, you take a snapshot of a container, you push it there, and then you've got a revision, and they're immutable. 
but you can have multiple revisions or you can also have a uh, topology that you only want one revision uh, to do that. And that's nice if you want to just have an operational workflow that every time you push your revision, it is going to just overwrite it. But if you want something more like blue-green deployment, you need a revision one, revision two, and then do a, a failover between them. And then you can just push the images there with continuous deployment. And the Azure CLI actually goes and creates your GitHub actions for you. When I saw this, I thought someone is really reading my mind. So if you use the AZ CLI, the Azure CLI, and you go into the container apps option, it literally gives you the option to create that entire GitHub workflow directly off the command line. And that's how I did it. Uh, as part of my uh, processing for this demo, I just used the, the CLI. So once you have a, a revision, you don't need to activate it. You can just deactivate it and it stays there as part of that. You can also label it. So if you want to label it, it gives you a unique label per revision. So you can say staging or testing, and you also still have direct access to that revision, but you don't necessarily have to worry about losing sight of that revision. You can use ingress traffic splitting. So in this example here, I'm going to take 80% of that traffic to container one, uh, revision one, and then 20% to that pod. So you can, you can do beta testing. You can actually say, hey, everyone, customers, clients, uh, and your internal staff, I want you to do dog food. So something we do at, at Microsoft is we dog food everything. I dog food office, teams, or the, 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 the actual uh, technology. And it's got me in a little bit of trouble sometimes because it goes, I'm now installing Microsoft updates. But you want a dog food. And you can do that with uh, ingress traffic uh, splitting. You can also do API management. So if you go from the marketplace there, you can just go contain app, and you can just take your Swagger, it will import your Swagger services directly for you with API management. VNet support, and this is something that we recently launched though. You can go in there and you can see how you can do VNet support, container apps by, uh, by uh, OVNet. And you can see there inside that subnet, it gives you the, the ability to have on-premise uh, or express root uh, VPNs, private link to your container registry here. And you then you have a public internet uh, with uh, that. Okay, so now that I've told you about this, I also want to introduce you to something that the woke community calls the cancel culture. So cancel culture basically means any kind of uh, 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 woke idea. So be it um, uh, a, a concept, they want to cancel it quickly and, and move it away. So one of the things about cancel culture that you might know, it's the great resignation where everyone just said, I'm canceling employment. Yes. Okay, cool. They still need jobs. But the cancel culture, uh, I like to think happened with Eureka. So I being a Java developer was introduced to Spring Cloud uh, in about 2000 and. 2009 when it was still in beta. Now Spring Cloud was made famous by the Netflix OSS stack. So the Netflix OSS stack uh, was the back-end system that Netflix ran to connect so customers could connect to their underlying services and you would get the, like the Netflix bar. And the nice thing about that is that every single time that you wanted to spin up Netflix, you actually used Eureka. But the problem is that they stopped supporting it. And in 2018, they canceled it. Now, Eureka was a pivotal uh, tool that a lot of services used for a, a registry, so a service registry. So as you spun up a new uh, microservice, you would get it and it would register with the Eureka dashboard. And then other microservices would also uh, be able to access that and it was canceled. So what happened is that people scrambled to go and find new services that would do something uh, familiar. And we, we, we found now that developers needed services. They, they needed something to deploy scale-out apps for flexibility costs and efficiency still. And we, we thought my, maybe microservices would come and go, but they, they're here to stay. They needed to develop those microservices that interact with each other, focuses on building and not the infrastructure. So Kubernetes was pushed aside. You can still use Kubernetes, but we wanted to really have increased developer velocity. Serverless platforms. So you want to be able to have serverless, and not only we've got the iPhone 10 still coming in there, 
uh, and the simple code to uh, cloud pipelines and using multiple languages and frameworks during development. So whatever the, the dashboard uh, really wanted to, sorry, whatever the, the technology had to do, it had to be open source, multi-language, and also be able to be similar to the Eureka dashboard. So what held back microservices? There was limited tools and uh, frameworks, the runtimes, limited language support, and also limited portability. So we're introducing Dapper, and I actually wanted to show a picture of Dapper Dan. If you don't know Dapper Dan, he's someone who, who really wears a nice suit and tie, and he, he really uh, epitomizes the, the, the smart gentleman uh, who wears uh, Swedish uh, double, double cuff cotton uh, outfits here. And you can access Dapper. It's open source, github.com, Dapper, Dapper. Um, and you can go to dapper.io. My only bane is that it's very cloud agnostic. So the problem is that I wanted to actually show some really great Azure examples. There is no mention of Azure on Dapper. It really is a, a, a developer first platform, multi-platform, and it's like a standard. Think, think REST or uh, SOAP or Eureka. Now, Eureka was led by the Netflix OSS stack, but when they uh, canceled it, it really led to a problem because it didn't have anyone to take the, the helm. So let's go back here. And you can get a lot of patterns on the, I'm actually drawing on here. That's what I've realized. Someone is drawing or I'm drawing here. Oh, I did draw previously. Uh, you can get a lot of patterns on there. So go to the dapper.io and have a look at those uh, services. Let's actually make that a little bit bigger there. Let's go make that bigger. There we go. Um, okay, cool. We'll come back to why that looks like drawing there. So Dapper goals, and I think I've sold Dapper to you really, uh, best practice building blocks. They took Eureka, they took the best of those services and they said that works that didn't work and why they needed the best uh, uh, different building blocks so when you look at building blocks it's services that dapper support so th so eureka was a service registry right but we need more than just a service registry we need the ability to also manage the life cycle of your app we need to be able to have pub sub uh, you need to be able to uh, register apis pluggable components and use any language or framework so not only Java, because Netflix actually wrote it in Java, .NET, Python, Go, Ruby, any language, standardization, and then platform agnostic, any cloud, and also edge though, and uh, community driven and also vendor neutral. So what are the building blocks? So first of all, you access these building blocks with a, an HTTP API or a gRPC API. So gRPC, incredibly lightning fast, but HTTP easier to use. And then you can access all of these different building blocks. Now, some clouds don't support all of the building blocks. And I'm gonna show you some of the building blocks that Azure doesn't actually support. But these are all of the current published building blocks. So you've got service to service invocation. We're gonna go through an example of how to do that. And that's if I have a service and I publish it in a, a container, how do I access that service? State management, the service needs to actually persist state. And remember, the, the container is going to become up and down. There needs to be a state store, similar to how a lot of people use Redis for a in-memory state. But this is actually state management, so to create long-running stateful uh, and stateless sessions. Publish and subscribe. So if I'm actually going to publish it, I want a mechanism to have people listening, similar to basic queuing. Bindings, input and output, so you can actually trigger and you can bind to the uh, underlying resources such as databases and queues. Actors, and this is a huge drive recently. And I still think that Scala was a pivotal point when, uh, when it was adopted by Twitter because people really understood the power behind actors. And actors are threads, virtual threads, that understand their own life cycle. They don't need the developer or the technology to manage it. They understand their own life cycle. Um, and you can do that with Dapper. Observability, I want direct access to logs, to events, to a lot of those mechanisms across the components and network services. And then finally, 
Uh, we have the three in beta, secret configuration and distributed logs. So these are, they haven't been launched in production grade to with Dapper right now. So secrets access your secrets from any application, similar to how Azure does Key Vault. Configuration, and I know what you're saying, you, a lot of you Eureka people remember there was central config in the Netflix OSS stack. So central config, imagine a JSON or YAML file there that you can actually pull those services and you can get that config from. And then finally, distributed lock. So mutually exclusive access to shared resources. Wow, this looks so incredible. Uh, what does Azure support? So first of all, any cloud or infrastructure, you can go through any uh, platform, any code, um, and then deploy to your uh, code. Now the Dapper components are also linked through to vendor specific uh, options. So you take your, uh, your YAML file that you wanna define. We have over a hundred components available right now, and you can actually go in and create your other one. So let's just say that you have a customer who needs to connect to a Dapper connection, and that customer has a certain protocol for that connector. You can write your own. And then you can actually go in and adhere to that standard. You can access more about that to create your components, github.com, uh, Dapper components, country. And they're, bro they're broken down into state stores, PubSub brokers, bindings and triggers, secret stores, observability, uh, configuration, and then uh, distributed uh, lock. So once you have that, the building blocks, now let's look at exactly what Azure supports. So Dapper currently is in version 1.8.1. This was about a month old. Now remember 1.8.1 is cutting edge. Not all vendors are going to support that. Azure supports 1.7.3. Now these currently secrets, configuration and distributed log are currently in um, uh, beta mode. So of course we're not gonna support them really because we don't really want to publish anything to production that isn't well supported. But you can still use for secrets, key vault, for, uh, let's go back there for a second. For configuration, you can still use uh, the API management and distributed lock. You can use Redis cache or also an underlying in-memory database. So now that you have your building blocks, how do you do service to service uh, invocation? So first of all, you're gonna have your two containers. You're gonna have your environment, Container app one, and then you've got your container app two. You've got your container uh, uh, container app, uh, containerized application, and then you have uh, something called a Dapper sidecar. Now, if you remember, Kubernetes made sidecars very popular, but what Dapper does, it has a sidecar that manages your your container, and it has a runtime, a, a hyper optimized runtime that gives you the ability to have those building blocks. So remember the, the building blocks there, I think there were about eight or nine of them. So if you want to use those building blocks, they come out of your Dapper sidecar. So if I wanted to post from a service, so over here, if I wanted to post uh, from app two, I would then use uh, container app one, and then I'll invocate. And remember, they know about each other because you're gonna use a central state store that Dapper is gonna to use to go in and register your apps. And I would say, contain app one, go invoke contain app two and get back the JSON information. Uh, and I'm gonna go localhost 3500 invoke app two. And I can have multiple versions for multiple uh, revisions. So state management there, I can use Firebase or Redis cache, Azure Cosmos DB, actually any state store. And an example that we're gonna to use today, I'm actually just using a file, uh, an Azure file, a blob storage there. And then you would actually go in and post that state store there to your underlying um, storage. Observability, so it uses OpenTelemetry, an incredible service that is tightly knit with Azure. And OpenTelemetry collects all your information there and publishes it to application insights. But you can also publish it if you remember there, collect it. Let's go see what we have there. And we're getting this observability to Prometheus, to Zipkin, to Jaeger. And we're getting more as we progress down the life cycle. Okay, so uh, PubSub. So this is one of the examples that I wanted to show you the, um, the building blocks. 
So you've got Azure Service Bus. Now let's just say you've got a payment system or downstream system, then you would actually have your container app. Uh, so the publisher or subscriber. So the publisher app then would have a Dapper uh, sidecar. And in the pub sub here, the definition on the actual container app, you would just publish it there to say component types, and you would say service bus. It would plug into your service bus config, and then the scopes would be publish app and subscribe app, and then your sidecar would actually receive it there. There's the container app there, uh, subscriber, and it wouldn't have to really know about the publisher. It would just know that it is scoped into the pub sub for the Azure service bus. So now I've got a demo. So briefly before we do the big boy demo, I wanted to show you how to get started with a Dapper. And this is a very simple little demo here. You can start it on it with a container apps Dapper. Um, and this demo there takes a Python container as Dapper with a node containerized app and uses the sidecars there for and with Azure storage. So let's stop the slide deck here and let's go into our browser here. I'm very curious to what those lines are there. I think I drew on my screen for some reason or my screen is giving me some, maybe I, I, if my Mac dies, I get a new Mac. I, I love that. Mac, please die. I want a new M2 Mac. So let's go into uh, that uh, example there, and let's see exactly what we what we publish though. So let's let's open up uh, VS Code. No, I said I'm going to live in the browser. Sorry, that's reminding me I'm in the browser. So let's go to portal.azure.com. Make that a little bit bigger. Here's my container apps. Here's my uh, node app, which actually registers and receives messages from the Python app. Now, the novelty of that is that it right now is receiving messages from uh, Python app. And I can go into that. Uh, let's just see. I wanted to see exactly on that PowerPoint there. Uh, yes. Okay. So let's, and I've got a little, now this is a thing there. Uh, so the headless Python app has no ingress that calls the node service to service to service invocation. So we want to go to the Python app there. So I've created these apps here. Now watch this inside the Python container app there. I have a little dapper, uh, field there. So I can actually go into that, uh, dapper field. And now I can see, wait a second, this Python app is aware of that node app because it's got dapper installed. So its name is uh, Python app, it's using HTTP. And now I'm using a state store uh, over here and I can manage my Dapper components via that. So my Dapper components now is part of the environment. So this is the actual environment for there. And I've got my state store and that is a blob storage. And the Dapper, Dapper components then, so both my Python node app will go into Dapper and register with that state store to say, yo, I'm up. Please tell other services that I exist though. So you've got uh, app, and then you've also got your account name and also your uh, storage key here. So the app ID here is going to be registered in Node app, and the Python app actually doesn't register itself. It just registers uh, and pulls in, wait a second, state store, what services do you actually have running? So that's my uh, Python app. And then I can go into my container apps here with my Python app. And then I can go into uh, logs, log streams, or actual logs. And I can go in and pull my logs for uh, those services and get, wait a second, the Python app found that the, the node app was receiving messages here. And I think I have a, a container qu query here. Uh, let's go here. There we go. Run that. And then it will see there that you've got some results here, get new order, successfully persisted state, and it will go through. And uh, to prove a great little demo here, there it is. It just ran recently uh, on the, yeah, yesterday. Uh, no, sorry, today. There we go. It ran today. And this is not really costing you that much. If I go into the Python app, uh, let's, let's do a little bit of a cost equivalent. And I want to see, how, okay, cool. How much is this Python app actually cost? You can actually go in there. Now, what I've set this Python app to do is um, it's set to zero 
containers unless uh, it performs a service triggered by either a schedule or other services. Let's just see what the cost is. And I, 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 I built this yesterday uh, via the demo. So let's just see uh, four costs, no cost, no cost, zero cost, which is an, an incredible service because it's it's basically probably never going to hit anything uh, below the, the free tier. And this is lovely because it basically means a lot of your services now should not cost you. You've got a container, you've got an app, you've got a service, you've got an event there, you pop it onto container apps then. And as long as you don't actually do like, you know, churning of processor, uh, you can actually set the containers here to scale. So that Python app that we that we had there. So let's go quickly into the scale. Um, so I've got min max make, uh, one, but let's go back into the uh, node app. And uh, let's just see the scale here also. I think it's set to one also, but you can actually go edit and deploy and you can set it to zero. Uh, so zero here and you can set it to zero there and it will only scale based uh, on uh, usage. Okay, so that's Dapper. Let's go back to our little uh, PowerPoint presentation here. Now let's also go back into uh, the slide deck here. Now we're going to do the big boy demo. We've got 20 minutes left. And now I'm going to show you exactly what I did uh, with little old me with uh, the demo. So let's go into, uh, I want to go into maximize screen. You can access the start of this project in the Spring Pet Clinic. So I took a, uh, an app. I didn't even, I don't own that Spring Pet Clinic application. And the finish there, you can access, if you want to see what the code that I did, uh, on caps-java. So first of all, we're going to live in the browser, and we're going to start in the browser with an inner loop. So what an inner loop is means that inside the browser, inside a code space uh, environment, I'm going to have the ability to debug my code, code and build up all of my extensions, and also run the container locally, which is an important concept to understand. Because if you're working in containers, you want to debug and run your container locally and code and test and debug inside your dev cluster, including Docker Compose and other such services. Then in the demo, we're going to push to GitHub and we're going to trigger a build and release lifecycle. So we're going to build it then using uh, Maven and it is going to go and build the, uh, uh, the application and then it's going to build the uh, the actual container and push it to a container image, which is an Azure uh, hosted in an Azure container registry. We're going to scan everything at the same time using Playwright. So Playwright is one of the new tools that Microsoft has, similar to Selenium, except it's multi-platform and also multi-language. So if you have a Node, Java, Ruby, Go, Python requirement to do end-to-end -end integration testing. I'm going to show you a very simple demo on how to do that with uh, Playwright. And we're going to use GitHub Actions to deploy that to our environment. I'm going to use a single revision, but you can actually do staging and production. And then finally, I'm going to use CodeQL to scan for any uh, underlying securities. Stop what you're doing right now. If you're not using CodeQL, do your company and yourself a favor. It's free. Just activate CodeQL uh, monitoring on your repo to make sure that you do not enter any dependencies that have CVEs and also uh, underlying uh, code that might be a CVE. Um, uh, uh, what's, what's the right word? Vulnerable. Yes, yes. That makes me feel like I'm, I've had too much wine. Oh, Rory, you're so vulnerable. And then finally, all of that is going to be pushed to monitoring with application insights and logs. Exactly like we saw the Dapper component there with the Python and the Node app. It's going to be pushed to Azure Monitor uh, with logs. Okay, so next demo, please. So let's start this up. Uh, and I want to show you the, the actual app first. Um, no, I actually don't want to show you that. I'm going to close that. Now, watch this. Nothing in my sleeves here. I'm going to go into GitHub. And I'm going to go into the sample that I created here. And this was the one that I keynoted Microsoft Build for. And I've created, now you can run this locally. And it's got a, uh, it's going to use the underlying dev container. And that dev container is the basic Linux dev container. And I love that dev container because it gives me a lot of services. But I'm going to create my code. 
and I've, re I've created my code space on main here. Now this is Azure samples, so I don't pay for this, which is great. The Azure samples team does. Um, and this is, uh, how many CPUs is this? Uh, I think this is only, let's just go manage one. I want to see how many CPUs it is here. Eight core. Oh, I love those 32 cores. Hey, those 32 core uh, uh, code spaces with 128 gigs of RAM are just uh, incredible. Okay, so uh, now that we've got our code space and we're going to start it up. So you can see there, you can also do open this code space in VS Code Desktop if you wanted to. So all of this, you can actually run locally. So code spaces is great, but not, not everyone wants to use code space. You can run all of this locally. Now I've got my code space uh, started. And you'll see there uh, inside uh, my code space, I've installed a few extensions there. Let's go see those extensions. And the extensions are the Docker extension, uh, the Azure extension, and the uh, Java extension and the Spring extension. So just basic Java uh, dev containers. So my application is the Spring Pet Clinic application. Um, and if you don't know the Spring Pet Clinic application, it really, uh, well, let me start it up and you can have a look at the Spring Pet Clinic application. So I'm gonna go to run, and then I'm gonna go uh, run Spring Pet Clinic application. I'm gonna pop a little debug point. And we want, wow. Okay, so let's see what we're doing here. I think I'm in, okay, let's just see here. I think I might be in the, the right project. Uh, yeah, yeah, so the Azure samples. Okay, cool. So uh, we clicked the debug uh, project on the owner controller, and now I've started it up. And now I'm in my inner loop. So I want to debug and test and run all of these things. And I've uh, done that. And it's going to pick up the port automatically for me. There it is, port 8080. I'm going to open the browser. And you'll see here, it is now got the Spring Petting application. So I can find owners to and take my pet to vet if, and can even trigger an error message here. So I want to click find owners here. And I'll click find all owners. Now remember, I'm in the browser. What is that red thing in the top there? That's a breakpoint. So I can go into the breakpoint there and I can see, wait a second, there's a problem. The owner that I'm looking for is uh, empty. So I'm gonna go owner, find the watch point there. And I can see, wait a second, the owner's empty. So now I'm gonna uh, take the breakpoint off and carry on there. And I can go, okay, cool. Uh, I've got all my owners here, but I've got George Franklin here. So I wanna, I wanna take that, that name there. I wanna find the owners. And I want to go find Franklin. It's going to find George Franklin. And I want to make sure I'm finding the right person. So my owner controller, I've got a, a system output uh, last name. Uh, that's not really that readable. So what do I do? Do I debug and I change it? Do I stop and start? What I've done on my uh, Spring Pet Clinic application here is I've set the spring.devtools.restart enabled to false. Because a little, a little kind of uh, text there. Very simple. Well, that means that I can now hot code deploy. So if I go back into my application, uh, let's just move that a little bit there on the controller. Now I can actually go, woof, let's now put in a string here called owner and plus it there. And I can just click on the little lightning arrow without restarting. It's just going to go and inject the code. You can see at the bottom there, one Java class uh, is reloaded. Now I can go back in there, and if I do the same thing, and I find owners, let's click that live, find owners. Now it says uh, owner and blank. So I've finished my, dip, my, my uh, inner loop for my testing. I can stop that. Now I want to push everything to a Docker container. So I've got my little Docker container running here. And it, it's basically pretty, pretty simple. It just says from the Microsoft registered and supported containers here at JDK 11, take my Spring app there, Spring Click Clinic uh, 2.6.0, the snapshot, and then go in, uh, copy it to my Docker container and give set the max percentage memory at 75%, which is an important uh, concept because Java is cloud native. 
uh, from Java 11 and it understands Docker. So you want to tell it how much memory. Then I can actually just go into my Docker file, right click in there, I can go build image. Now this is going to build it into, uh, yeah, we're going to do that, Spring Picnic latest. It's going to build it into my code space environment. It's going to go through there, it's going to find all of the different layers. And it's also going to find the underlying jar that I recently built and go in and add it uh, to that uh, layer also. Now, this is very quick because code spaces actually exist as close as possible as the wild internet. And as, as a South African, I really appreciate fast internet. So now we can go into the Docker instance here and we can see there uh, Spring Pet Clinic has been lo loaded. Now I'm going to finish off my inner loop by right clicking that and go run. I can also run interactive. I can attach an SSH shell to that. Um, and I'm running Docker in Docker. I'm literally running Docker in the browser in my code space instance. And it's, I can right click on there and go um, view, view logs, attach shell. Uh, and yeah, so it's going to view the log. There's my pet clinic application. application. Now I can open up uh, my browser and I've got my pet clinic application. And that's the inner loop. Run debug, you hot code place, and then push the, the actual Docker file. Now I've got my Docker file. I want to make a little change to it. So uh, we can actually trigger the uh, change there. Uh, and I can just say there, testing. So I've got my Git repo here. I don't want to uh, check in. I want to discard those changes and I want to commit uh, and push. Testing. Commit and push. Always. It's going to push to that. And where did I push? Now, remember what I said to you that when I created my container app, I actually created a, a trigger for um, the GitHub Actions that you get with the Azure CLI. So all I've done there uh, with that is I've just made sure that I've built my application there with Maven uh, build. And then I've set up Docker on my underlying GitHub Action. I've logged into a container registry. I did create the container registry beforehand. I've pushed my image, the Spring Picnic application and tagged it also. I then go in and log into Azure with my deploy stage. And then I deploy to container app there. And it's as simple as just going container app, get me that image and then container app update. Now I've set my container app as a single revision. And then also I have the Git code QL um, analysis that will stop my build if ever I enter any CVE. And the, the code QL basically goes in there uh, checks the language, so I've set it up as Java, builds my application, and then performs code QL analysis and triggers any type of workflow to say if there is a CVE. And then I can be guaranteed that I'm not entering into any dangerous uh, territory. So now we can go into our application. We can get out of the, uh, the sample here, and I can go into actions here, and I can see there that my code QL is busy being triggered and also my container app uh, trigger. And if I go into build, it's setting up the job, logging into Docker, it's going to build and deploy the registry. And then finally, it's gonna deploy it. So what does this application actually look like? Let's go back into our portal. Notice I haven't left the browser once. I did, we don't have enough time though, but I did want to show you, you can go in there and you can look at, uh, I ran an end-to-end -end test there also using um, uh, Playwright. And I can go into my container apps and I've got the Spring Pet Clinic application here. And if I go into the Spring Pet Clinic application, uh, you'll see there that uh, the actual um, URL is uh, available. Um, where will we come URL? Uh, let me just minimize it a little bit there. There we go. There's my URL. And it will come up when the, the build is finished, uh, the environment, the log analytics. And if I wanted to go into my revision management, and then we'll take Q&A after this, I'm going to give you some, some nice uh, homework here. If I go into my revision management, you see there that I've got my revision management. I can go in and uh, label it if I wanted to, label it to staging. Uh, traffic is 100%. 
the containers. Let's look at the containers that I've set here. And that's my Docker file that I've actually pushed. Let's see if the, the container has been uh, published yet. It's busy deploying it there. You shouldn't even notice a blip for it when it does there. I set up the number of cores at two, uh, two cores and four gigs of RAM. So you can have direct access to your underlying containers. You can set up environments, uh, health probes, and then the scale I set to zero. So, which means that the first time I hit the application is going to bring up a container, but it also means that if I hit HTTP scaling with new load, uh, so concurrent requests, then I should actually be able to scale up. So I can go up to five, you can go up to quite a few numbers there. So uh, let's wait for that build to, to finish. And then I'm going to actually go in and hit it. Now it should take a few seconds that it's uh, completed. Now, if I go into my Spring Picnic application and I hit this, watch this, the container doesn't exist and it's not costing me anything. And I'm going to hit it and it's going to take a few seconds to actually start up. Well, faster than, faster than I thought, actually. So find owners, that was, you know what? Because I did give it two gigs of uh, RAM. I learned that. Java likes memory. Find owners here and you can actually add some telemetry here. It's using an underlying H2 database, but you can actually plug it in with environment variables. Uh, you can go errors, uh, veterinarians here. And then if you wanted to, you can go into log stream, into metrics. So if we wanted to go see the, the console app there, uh, we can go in to log stream and we can see all of those uh, metrics that you have there. And I've never left the browser. I've got my uh, pet clinic application there and I showed you how to do a inner loop. I see there, that's me triggering a, a, an exception there. Uh, and then I can go in and add all of my other uh, metrics there uh, for that. Um, and then finally, if I wanted to scale, I can just scale up at any given time. So let's finish off the PowerPoint. So homework today. I sit with the product teams who create these technologies and we have a workshop for you and uses Quarkus supersonic subatomic um, uh, 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 cloud native Java to compress it in there. And you can create a superhero UI. So if you wanted to see what that looks like, let me just quickly uh, show you. And I've got a, a local build here because I realized that we're running out of time. So I'm just going to go locally build here. I'm going to go into the uh, clock of superheroes. So this is what it is. Um, and we can just uh, run that locally here, compose up, and you can you can run it and it uses Docker Compose, and then it publishes it to Docker Compose um, and also to Quarkus. Takes the entire Docker Compose file, which has about six or seven different uh, elements there, um, and then once that's uh, completed, then you'll you'll get that. So you can go through that uh, that workshop there, and it's an incredible step by step workshop. Takes about two hours. Um, and uh, you can use this in code spaces if you want. Uh, so started healthy. Look at look how many freaking Docker containers. That's so powerful. And you can start with that. We'll come back to that now. Uh, we want to do some questions. And you can go to that. And this is really what you do. You get a superhero. And these are all containers then, all serverless. And you can go in and create uh, that workshop. And of course... I am a content provider, a content writer for Microsoft. If you want to learn about Java on Azure, go to aka.ms Java Learn Path. And then finally, follow me on Rory Pretty on at Rory Pretty. So that URL again there, the CAPS workshop. And we run that with customers all around the world. Incredibly popular workshop. Um, and then you can actually go in. Uh, we should actually go in. Let's see if we can go localhost 8080. There's the superheroes. So uh, sometimes the images do come through a little bit weird. I want to go find one there, new fighters. I do find that with Docker Compose locally here, yeah, sometimes the, the images don't come through. So I just want to find one that where the images do come through. There we go. And we have Gamora, you know, from Avengers and Superwoman. Now it, it does cheat a little bit because it shows you the, the, the power ratio there, but you can actually go fight. And it will uh, go and show you how to do that. And you can actually do the fight date there. So that's the demo and the workshop I want to show you using Quarkus native containers. So this is running on Docker Compose, but we're going to show you how to do that with container apps. You can take everything that I did there and you're going to pop it on uh, container apps. So we're, we're out of time now. So I am going to take some questions.
questions uh, and leave the slide deck on there to show you uh, that uh, workshop. Rory, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, for our audience, as, as per Rory's indication, I'm just gonna ask if you do have any questions, just pop those into the chat window, we'll pick them up there and then pose those through to Rory. Rory, while, while they're busy kind of recovering from that rapid fire introduction to almost everything you ever need to know in containerization as it is in the brain of Rory, I, I just wanted to pull out one or two things quickly, which I, which I as a non-technical person, found interesting. You're putting in a lot of comments around zero cost and free and zero instances there at the startup, which is a very different mindset, I think, to, to perhaps how development has been done in the past. Is, is that something that you're going, hey, developers, this is now something that really has to be part of your skill set and your consideration in terms of app development design and deployment? Or is it something that you alone are standing out there championing the cause and others are going no, crazy, so, Rory? So serverless containers is not a new thing. A lot of people have already been, if you think about it, Azure Functions is a serverless container. It runs with service fabric underneath there. So this is the cost analysis that I, I've, do, I've done for the Spring Pet Clinic. And this is, uh, let's go this year. This is everything that I've done. And I've demoed this hundreds of times uh, across different customers here. And it's cost me the entire time uh, $2. And this is a full Spring Pet Clinic application with end-to-end -end, uh, that. And you can see there, um, there is no option here. For costing, if you think that see there, there's no premium service or anything like that. You you have uh, zero cost on most of the examples because in truth, what you want is developers to to feel enabled. They're not going to feel enabled if they've got a Kubernetes cluster. And I once left a Kubernetes cluster over the weekend, and I got a call from the Microsoft, you know, uh, Central Risk Committee going, "We are noticing that you've spent more than your quota." We're going to be downscaling you uh, uh, for a very long time. And I thought to myself, I'm scared. Now, if I'm scared and I have like, you know, $500 to spend a month, developers should also be scared. And this is what I love about uh, the service here, which is un unless you're doing a lot of load, zero cost, zero, zero cost per container there. And for the entire year, uh, accumulated cost for 2022 cost me $2. Breaking the bank there, Rory. So yeah, That's compared least, to, but... if I was running a Kubernetes cluster, madness, madness. Yeah, that, that probably cost you at least two Red Bulls right there and a sponsorship potential. Oh, you think, yeah, yeah, Red Bull. And not, not the, not the sugar-free, yes. Bring it up. Yeah, there we go. Uh, all right, we've got a couple of questions coming through for you. Uh, Ilan asks, are custom domains also free? I have no idea what that means, but I'm going to throw that at you anyway. I'm not too sure. Um, so custom domains, let's click there. Uh, it, it depends though, uh, IP address, custom domains, uh, custom, you manage certificates, you need a certificate. So I don't think that the domain is the problem, but a certificate is a, a certificate here. So if you want to create a, a managed certificates, go to container apps environment here, and you need a certificate, private key certificates here uh, for TLS. So you do get the option for TLS here, add certificate. So let's click, click, through through and let's see exactly what uh, so unique friendly name and you need to a certificate file uh, so you, you want a PEM file or a PS uh, for uh, SSL and I think that's where you, you that that actual service is free but you need a, a SSL and that's a whole different story because it de depends also on the service provider Thoughty or um, whoever they use now as open SSL here you can actually get a domain from Azure but that's usually linked to a service. For example, on the premium services for app service, you get a free uh, a domain with that. So if you go into uh, app services here, and I want to go into, this is a cheap service that I've run here, also uh, use using for that. And if you want to scale up here, TLS, so uh, scale up here, then you'll notice that as you get to a higher tiering, then you, you'll you get more free services bundled a, as part of that though. So have a look at that. Uh, so let's go uh, production here. And then as part of the production, you see the custom domains SSL um, will uh, configure and yeah, so with that bindings there. So uh, to answer your question is you need a certificate. Thanks, Rory. Um, got a couple more coming through. Selma asks, the decision tree right at the start recommends AKS when access to Kubernetes API is required. 
what kind of workloads and use cases would a AKS still be suitable for? Murder, murderously yes. big uh, workloads. <laughs> that service that I did there, one or two services there. Kubernetes runs, you know, space stations. It's it's not a it's not something that you should run a small app or operational workflows here. So. Typically, you're going to use Kubernetes and access to the underlying Kubernetes API uh, if you need um, a service that gives you a competitive advantage. So let's just say you have an image scanning for uh, invoicing. You want direct access to the lowest level cost of that, though. Remember, there's a service abstraction for container apps. You don't get underlying access to the Kubernetes API. So as a result, you also don't get access to scale on, uh, uh, on, on your terms. They should be scaling that I showed there and some of the other scaling though. You might want to scale based on different criteria. So you want that access uh, if you would need low level control. But for developers and for your your the, the use cases I showed there, you don't need underlying access uh, to that, uh, that Kubernetes uh, API. Okay. You definitely should finish the Red Bull before I, I finish reading this one to you. So, Isaac is asking a couple of questions. Let's just hit the first one to begin with. Um, uh, question one, is this a service mesh architecture for microservice probably based on Istio? Is that suitably cryptic? Uh, it's not a service mesh. We actually have service mesh. It's a, a different services. This was uh, from the ground uh, up in development though. But the good thing about this, you can actually go into dapper.io, you can see everything for the actual underlying service though. It's completely open source. So you can actually get the, the underlying uh, docs for this and the GitHub repo. So if you're gonna to go to docs, uh, it's part of the Cloud Nat Native Foundation. If you know them, they, they create Linux, they create the Kubernetes architecture. So you can go in there and you can see uh, reference guides here for their architecture. There was an architectural diagram that actually shows you there. You can see their 1.8 developing up uh, concepts. So you can go into concepts here, building blocks, components, but there was an architectural, there we go, Dapper and Service Mesh. Uh, so how Dapper compares to and works with Service Mesh. So I can pop it in here and it will show you there, use a sidecar architecture, uh, runs a separate process. Um, how does Dapper compare to Services Mesh, such as LinkedIn, uh, ISTO and Open Service Mesh among others? So you can actually go in there, uh, yeah, so how it compares then, the different services, which services it actually compares. So service mesh includes that, whereas Dapper compare, uh, includes that. So Dapper is a little bit more closer to the underlying developer tools and it's more developer focused. I'll put it in the chat. Your super brain has really answered, I think, questions two and three from Isaac at the same time. Fantastic, Rory. So we'll try to jump through to the very next thing. Sorry, I got a phone ringing in the background there. Uh, where did that question go? Come here. Uh, here we go. In the demo architecture, gateway API is missing. How do you manage authentication rate limiting inversion? So actually a very new service that they just launched for that. Um, so if you go into container apps, into uh, the Spring Petcalink application, you'll see there's an authentication uh, option here, and you can actually uh, set up uh, a provider. So uh, add identity provider, and then you can go OAuth uh, or Active Directory. So there is an option to then, you can do the, the standard tokenization mechanism. So you can go provider, so you can go Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, uh, GitHub, uh, then you can set up your underlying permissions. So let's uh, choose uh, GitHub. And you can have your client ID, your client secret, restrict access, uh, unauthorized requests, redirect to, and then you can set up the scope for your ind individual application uh, or your environment. Um, yeah, so I, I, I can't do this demo end to end there, but have a look at uh, the uh, identity provider and then set up the uh, permissions accordingly. <laughs> Rory, I think that's all we're going to have time for today. So, Rory Brady, uh, Microsoft Cloud Advocate and, and Principal Cloud Advocate, thank you so much for spending the time today. That's been an absolutely awesome session. I'm sure everybody here has really enjoyed it, including the continuous endorsement of Red Bull. 
and Azure as a platform for almost everything magic that you want to build and do. Um, Rory, there we go. You've already done it again. Prescient there, how you do that. If anybody wishes to connect with Rory, please follow him there at Rory Pretty. And again, follow us through on the workshop piece that he posed to you as well. I'm sure there's lots of learning in that. And as a final thing, again, Rory, thank you so much. That's been an absolutely wonderful session today on DBT Tech Insights. Thank you for your time and thank you to everybody for attending. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day, everybody. Till next time.